Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this planet, and welcome to our SETI Live. Uh, my name is Frank Marchis. I'm a researcher here at the SETI Institute in California. And uh, today we are going to have a SETI Live on a very unusual uh, signal, which has been recently discovered in the heart of the Milky Way. So for this, I invited um, the co-authors of this paper published recently in Astrophysical Journal. Uh, first, let me introduce to you uh, Tara Murphy. Hi, Tara, how are you? Hi, it's great to be here. Where are you uh, calling us from? I'm calling from Sydney, from University of Sydney in Australia. Okay, and uh, nearby on the other window, uh, we have Andy Wang. How are you, Andy? Yeah, good. Good? I'm yeah, I'm calling from Sydney too. Okay, so are you nearby each other, you two, or you are... <laughs> We, we, I'm, I'm at the University of Sydney, and I think Andy's calling from home, which is actually just down the road. All right. Yeah. It's early in the morning right now, right? Yeah, it's 10 a.m., yeah. so 10 morning tea time. All right, that's good. Okay, so today um, I invited you because uh, you're co-authors of this uh, very interesting paper, as I mentioned, and uh, we are going to talk about this uh, mysterious uh, radio source that was discovered using uh, Syro, Syro, you say? I forgot the way you pronounce Syro, it. Yes. Syro, yes, Syro. I visited this facility uh, two years ago, Syro ASCAP Radio Telescope. So let's start. I heard you have some slides to show us. What facility did you use? What What is this signal? Yeah, so if I show you my um, slide with our telescopes on, so here are, here are the telescopes we used in this project. The main one is ASCAP. So ASCAP is a new telescope. It's located in Western Australia. And uh, one of its really special properties is that it's very sensitive and has a very wide field of view, which means that it can see a lot of the sky at the same time. So that means that it's really great for doing surveys, going back and repeating, you know, covering a large area of sky and then repeating those observations. And the reason that's important for me is I lead uh, a project called VAST, the Variables and Slow Transients Project on ASCAP. And we're looking for radio objects that change on human timescales. So they change very rapidly uh, from seconds to hours to, minute, uh, to, hours to days to months. Um, and that's kind of unusual in astronomy. Most things are relatively unchanging in the radio sky. ASCAP lets us see those things that are undergoing some kind of energetic explosion or some other kind of extreme event. So this is a new facility that was designed and built uh, like over the past uh, five, 10 years? That's right. So uh, we've been building ASCAP over the last 10 years. And in the last two years, uh, it started full operations. And we've been conduct, well, I should say it started operations, full operations start next year. For the last two years, we've been doing um, what's called the pilot surveys. So we've each our team has spent a few hundred hours using ASCAP, testing it out and doing this initial science. And so it was part of one of these pilot surveys uh, that we found this object. We were pointing our telescope towards the galactic center because we know that in our galaxy, the galactic center is a really dense place. It's got a lot of stars, it's got a lot of dust, it's got a lot of stuff going on there in the center. And there have been some interesting radio transients discovered there before. So we thought this was a really interesting place to explore with our new telescope. Okay, so what did you find? So we were, I'm going to hand over to, to Andy. So um, he's the PhD student that made this discovery. Um, we started monitoring the center, uh, the central region of our galaxy with ASCAP. And uh, for quite a while, I think it was uh, several months, we didn't detect anything at the particular location of this source. But then uh, we did make a detection and we noticed that this object was extremely variable. So it was changing by up to a factor of 100 in brightness, which is very unusual. So I'll hand over to Andy to tell you a little bit more about um, the discovery and, and what we learned about this object. Yeah, thanks. So besides the rapid like changing in the flux, we also see like the source was like highly polarized. So the polarization is something different from uh from what we can see by our eyes, because our eyes cannot distinguish polarized uh signals from the unpolarized one. Uh, but ASCAP has something like a Polaroid 
sunglasses as what we use uh, in the normal life, it can, dis uh, it can distinguish uh, the polarized emission and unpolarized one. And we found this source was highly polarized. Uh, and for the all the polarized source, there's only like uh, 10 out of thousands of sources to be polarized. So it is an unusual. So uh, the source is highly polarized. It is unusual. And it is also highly, uh, it is highly variable and highly polarized. So it is a very unusual source. source. So it's a radio source, which has a variation of intensity of the scale of what? We're talking about minutes, hours? It varies uh, in a time scale of, I think should be months or weeks. As okay. you can see in this light curve, uh, you can see like the source just, just changing rapidly at the time scales of about weeks or days or months. Okay. And on the top of that, this source has a, a polarization. That means it has a property which is different to most radio source. Uh, a pulsar is not polarized. Is that correct? That's right. So most, most radio sources are not polarized. And um, so when you put those things together, the high variability and the polarization, it means that it limits what this can be to only a few types of objects. And so our initial hypotheses were that this could be, for example, a flaring star. So you know that our, our own sun has solar flares. Um, there's a type of star called M dwarf stars, which are much, much cooler stars than our sun. And interestingly, they have flares that can be thousands of times brighter than our sun's solar flares, and they are often highly polarized. So we thought this object could be a star, a flaring star. Mm -hmm. But when you look at that region with an optical telescope, and so um, to think back at what we're doing here, we're using a radio telescope. So we're, we're detecting wavelengths of light that are centimeters to meters long. Obviously, when you use an optical telescope, you're, you're detecting visible light. And so that's hundreds of nanometers long. That's the wavelength. So these are exploring very different types of electromagnetic radiation. Now, when we look with an optical telescope, we see things that are hot like stars. And so when we look in this same spot that our object is, there's nothing there. And so for this to be a star, it would have to for this to be a star and detected with our radio telescope, it would have to be so faint uh, that it would be an extremely cool star, cooler than the ones that we, you know, routinely detect. So we pretty much ruled out that hypothesis. So then there's another another hypothesis we had is that this could be a pulsar. So pulsars, which are the the dead remnants of stars, basically at the end of their life, they're the most dense objects we know in the universe, except for black holes. So they're extremely dense objects and they rotate very rapidly. That's the characteristic of pulsars. And they rotate on a, a full rotation of the object every second to millisecond. So you imagine something, the mass of the sun rotating um, on, on, on timescales of milliseconds. It seems ridiculous. It's hard to believe that it happens, but it does. Now they have these um, uh, emission that comes out of the poles of the axes of the stars. When it's rotating, if that emission beam happens to be pointing towards Earth, we see it, and that's what causes the characteristic pulse. Mm -hmm. So we looked for this. We looked for this. These pulses with the Parkes telescope, which is a famous Australian telescope, well known for its discovery of many pulsars, and we didn't find any. But the thing is, we didn't know because, as you saw from the light curve, this object had been switched off for months at a time. So when we observed it with Parkes, uh, we didn't know, is this just because there's no pulses or is this just because it's switched off? And so our next idea was to go to the Meerkat telescope and do some observations there. So I'll let Andy describe why Meerkat is so important. And I'll, I'll switch back to the light curve while he's talking so that you can see what we mean. Yeah, so the reason we use Meerkat is that like we can use Meerkat to do a like something like a monitoring program. Like we observe this source every two weeks for about 15 minutes to try to uh, detect this source again. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't catch up this signal uh, in the first maybe three months. 
Uh, but fortunately, at the, in this February this year, they finally catch the signals appears again. And the reason why we use Meerkat is that Meerkat has a ability to do the like do the imaging, like do the observations at the polar searching at the same time. So that if we catch the sources on and we have a high time resolution data so that we can search for the pulsation. Uh, if we find there is pulsation, we can say, okay, now the source is a polar. But if we cannot find any pulsation, that means this is highly uh, unlikely to be a pulsar, and we can set some constraints on the property of the signal. So yes, we used we used another new radio telescope, Meerkat, and and found that there were no pulses. So we end up with this source that has some of the properties of a flaring star, but there's no star there, and it has some of the properties of a pulsar, but it doesn't have the pulses that a pulsar has, uh, and hence it's a bit of a mystery. All right. So uh, before we go more into the conversation, because I have a ton of questions, I would like to say that we have people watching us from Pennsylvania, Orlando, Florida. I was there recently to watch the lunch, so hello. Italy, Montana, North Carolina, Guam, Canada, Iowa, Adelaide, Australia, Oregon, Indiana, Hawaii, Chicago, Maryland, Kansas, Virginia, Sacramento, Oklahoma, London, and Beth Johnson is watching us too. <laughs> hello, Beth. So, hello, everyone. Uh, <laughs> hello, everybody. Uh, so we are talking about this mysterious uh, signal, which was discovered nearby the center of our galaxy, uh, recently using the CSIRO ASCAP telescope, radio telescope. So um, I saw that in the paper you discuss about uh, pulsar possibilities, stars, and then you talk about magnetar as well. Do you, some, one of you wants to start the conversation about magnetar and tell us a bit more about that? Sure, I, c I can start that. Um, so magnetars are a special kind of neutron star that have an extremely strong magnetic field. And it was another idea that we had for the, for the reasons I discussed before. They are highly variable, they're circularly polarized. But with the magnetar, you expect there to be high energy emission like x-rays at the same time. And again, we were unable to detect this source in x-rays. So we had, a, we had a, a list of possibilities and Andy essentially did this very long, sort of year long detective work um, using every resource and you know existing data product and telescope that we could think of to observe this source and none of them were unable well, none of them were able to figure out exactly you know what it was all of the observations he did so that's the mystery i just mentioned to our viewers that we're going to take a few questions so take you to, take the time to uh, to write questions if you have any um so one question i have is why this was discovered only now I mean, we had radio telescope on this planet for 20 years, even more now, 40 years. So why now? Why is it technological issue? What's what, ha what happened here? Yeah, that is a really good question. And it's the argument for why we're building the radio telescopes we are now. So in the past, most radio telescopes, they could either see, um, see very faint things in a very small area, or they were, very, they were a lot less sensitive and can see a large area. So if you think about the job of trying to look for rare objects, and we know these objects are rare, as Andy explained before, um, then one of the strategies you'd want to use is observe as much of the sky as possible, as often as possible. If your telescope can only see a tiny region of sky at a time, it takes an enormously long time to survey the sky once. So for example, the survey I worked on when I was a student, uh, was uh, the Sydney University Malonglo Sky Survey. And that took 10 years to do what ASCAP can do in three days. So if it takes you 10 years to observe the sky, then when you finish that survey, you go, okay, now let's see if anything has changed. You can only explore a time scale of 10 years because that's how long it took. So there have only been surveys for variable things in radio. Um, for variable radio sources that are either very targeted or not very sensitive. And these telescopes like ASCAP and Meerkat are the first ones that allow us to look repeatedly at good sensitivity. 
and that's why we've that's why we've started finding these. So that's great for you, Andy, because this survey can do this telescope can do this kind of survey very quickly. So it means that you have a lot of data to analyze, and you don't have to do a PhD that will last for twenty five years. You can do it in three or four years, like a normal human being. So, yeah, so maybe Andy could talk about uh, what you think. Do you think that we'll be able to find more of these things, Andy? What are the next steps for you? Yeah, I think uh, definitely we might find more. Uh, like not only for this kind of sources, I expect maybe we can find more other type of sources in the future with wider, wide field of view and better sensitivity. I'm looking forward to see more such kind of sources and other kind of sources to be detected in the future. That's, uh, so basically we're opening a new window in the field of research in, in radio astronomy, thanks to those surveys, discovering those transient events and characterizing them and probably understanding that there is a lot we don't really understand in, yet in this universe. That's right. And, and I think one of the things with transient events at any wavelength that's very hard is because by their nature, they're not visible all of the time. It's hard to study them. So, for example, if Andy wants to do further observations of this object and he gets time on a telescope and he looks at this object, there's a good chance you can tell from our existing data that it won't be on at that time. So a different way that we approach things in astronomy is not just by saying let's study this one object in a lot more in a lot more detail what we say is let's collect a bigger set of these objects and uh, see if we can understand them by looking at their statistical properties and this object that andy has found it's very similar to a different class of things and when i say class that's very it's kind of very loose because there are only three things in this class um, but they're called galactic center radio transients mm -hmm. and that is um a name it's a it's the kind of name scientists give things when we don't know what they actually are it's just a descriptive name it's not a name based in physics it's a name where we're saying there's these objects that roughly share the same properties. They're highly variable. They're located towards the galactic center. They're uh, detected across a range of radio frequencies. They're, some of them are circularly polarized. They seem to vary on different timescales. Each one is different to each other one, but broadly they're kind of similar to each other. Andy's source is in that broad category. But so now maybe we have four of them, but in astronomy, what we'd like to do is have a hundred and okay. then we can actually say something about them as a group, even if any given one of them is not switched on at a particular time. So uh, we're starting having questions here. And one of them is, are you doing now? Are you observing this source now? Is there any radio telescope observing it almost continuously to, to know its viability of it is on and off? So, so the answer to that is no, uh, we are planning on observing it again, and we have done further observations since this paper, but we don't have a telescope that we can just use, a radio telescope that we could just point at it all the time. So this is one challenge actually with radio astronomy. Uh, with um, There are not that many radio telescopes and they're very competitive to get time on them. And, and so the chances of being able to just use one all the time to monitor something, it's almost impossible. So we are planning future campaigns and when ASCAP is in full operations, it will be repeatedly scanning the sky um, for our survey. And so we will hopefully detect this many more times next year, but right now we're not observing it at this moment. So we start having more questions, but before I ask the question, I would like to thank Pamela for the stars. We receive stars. So thank you very much, Pamela, for that. Uh, we, uh, yeah, one question, I, I like this one. What's the name of this source? I mean, you call it, Tara, I've been noticing you have been calling it Andy Source, which is great, but I know this has a real name because I saw the paper, I read the paper. So what's the name? Andy, do you want to, do you want to tell us the name? Don't cheat, uh, Andy. It is super <laughs> long. I'll say it is called, it is based on its, its position. So we will call it as ASCAP J. 1736.08.2 minus 32.16.35. It is just based on the position. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> so that's Sorry. <laughs> yeah. 
we're gonna Sorry, astronomers it. are very boring. <laughs> I know, I know. We're going to call it Andy's source for the moment. Yeah, I, I, I call it Andy's source because we're finding <laughs> quite a few interesting objects, actually. Not all of them are published yet. And, and this one is the one that obviously Andy's been working on for a year, so I call it Andy's source. In general, we call our sources by their coordinates so that other astronomers can look them up with their telescope. So anybody that has a telescope, you can point your telescope in that direction. Unfortunately, you probably won't see anything at this specific point in optical because we've already used um, very powerful telescopes to look there. But you can at least look in that direction and kind of think about what you could see. So another question we, are getting, we, we got here. Uh, what kind of development do you have in radio astronomy to look at those or to even go deeper into uh, into the sensitivity? Is there anything coming soon? There absolutely is. So uh, it's in the name of our telescope, so the Australian SKA Pathfinder. Uh, so, and I also mentioned Meerkat, which is a telescope in South Africa. Both of those telescopes are Pathfinder telescopes to the big one, which is called the Square Kilometre Array. Uh, so the Square Kilometre Array is a billion dollar international collaboration. It will be one of the biggest scientific instruments ever made. Um, it will be uh, half based in South Africa, uh, near where Meerkat is, and half based in Australia, in Western Australia, where ASCAP is. And it will be a lot more sensitive. Uh, it will be a completely survey telescope, just surveying the sky constantly. And its mission includes everything from looking for signs of life in other planets uh, through to um, studying uh, stars in our local neighborhood, through looking at galaxy evolution, through cosmic time, looking at for the first stars. Uh, so it's an enormous range of science that it covers. And one of those things is transients and uh, pulsars. So that's the, that's the future that we're looking towards. The construction has just started in both Australia and South Africa, construction of the Square Kilometre Array. So that's the thing to look for around the corner. All right. And I'm assuming you, Tara, you are involved in this project already? Yeah, I'm, I'm in one of the working groups for transients. Okay. And I'm hoping that, I mean, my students like Andy and other people, this is going to be, you know, their future career. That's, right. that's where the current uh, generation of students are going to have great jobs using you know, this telescope to discover things. I think it will be, you mentioned earlier, um, Frank, you said uh, a new window on the universe. I mean, that's really, the SKA is is really going to provide that. Yeah, it's a radio telescope that's half the size of a planet. So um, it's going to be interesting just to operate, I would say, across two continents and the challenge as well, but also it's going to provide a lot of interesting observation and data and go deeper. Uh, someone asked to kind of give us, we all know what optical telescopes do because we all have cameras on our phones and we take pictures. So it's kind of easy for people to understand. But in the case of radio astronomy, what exactly do you record and how, what's the data? What's the, what, what do they look like and how much of those data you have? So I think I'll probably answer this because I don't want to put Andy on the spot with his, um, you know, giving you a, a quick uh, uh, radio astronomy lesson. So the radio telescopes, as you can see in my in my background, this is ASCAP, uh, they mostly look like satellite dishes. And so the, the simplest answer is that they detect uh, electromagnetic radiation at very uh, low frequencies. So in other words, megahertz to gigahertz. That's the same kind of frequency that you use if, for example, you're using an analog radio. Um, so FM bands and so on. In fact, with our telescopes, we can detect radio. That's a huge problem uh, with our telescopes, which is why we build them in very remote regions, in this case, in the desert in Western Australia, to get them away from radio frequency interference. Radio frequency interference, RFI, it comes from every single electronic device you use, from microwaves, from phones, um, from TVs, everything like that, and they interfere with our signal. So if you're trying to think of what do radio telescopes see when they look at the sky, think about TV and radio transmissions. That's the kind of band that they see. Um, now, what do, they, what do they do? It's true that with an optical telescope, it's easy to kind of imagine the processing because an optical telescope is typically um, capturing photons in a similar way to uh, your camera captures photons on a CCD and counts the number of photons that are there and builds up 
what you can call an actual picture. It's, it's a picture, just like your camera takes an actual picture. Radio telescopes don't see a picture of the sky in the same way. So they essentially sample what's called a Fourier transform of the sky. So for those of you that have done maths, if you've done university level maths, you might remember Fourier transforms. And if you're not, you can, if you haven't, you might go and look that up. But basically what we see with a radio telescope is a sample of how bright things are at those radio wavelengths in different locations in the sky. And all the different antennas collect information uh, from a slightly different position. And then inside the telescope, inside the internals, it combines all those signals together and uses the delays between the signals to create a map of the sky. We then do a lot of computer processing to do those Fourier transforms and produce something that we call an image. And so if you look at, um, if I hang on, I need to uh, share my slides again. Oh, oops! I've just I've just stuffed up my slide sharing. Um, so if you look at the um, uh, picture that we had here, um, this this picture of the sky is what results the image that comes from the telescope. And you can see this is pointing towards the galactic center, uh, where we have supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star. And you see lots of, if you move away from the galactic center, you see lots of tiny little dots on the sky. Each of those tiny dots is a supermassive black hole at the center of a distant galaxy. And so that leads me to the second bit of what do radio telescopes see. Firstly, there's the electrical engineering signal processing answer. And then in terms of the science, what an optical telescope sees is typically um, hot things. So it, it sees thermal emission from stars and galaxies um, and things like that. What a radio telescope sees is typically uh, what's called synchrotron emission, which is, which is processes like electrons being accelerated in magnetic fields in extreme environments like supermassive black holes. And so we see a completely different picture of the universe. So it's, a, it's hard to answer more, obviously, in the limited you know, time we have in a, in a talk like this. But essentially, radio telescopes, they see low frequency electromagnetic radiation, similar to the frequencies that your TV and radio operates at. And they give us a different picture of the physical processes that are going on because they see different, they see the light from different physical processes than optical telescopes do. And we had a city talk on radio astronomy um... I think two months ago. So the person who asked this question can also have a look on the SETI talk. That was an introduction on how those telescopes uh, work. Uh, so that's a lot of data. I heard that ASCAP has more data than the entire internet of produce more data in a few nights than the entire internet connection of Australia. So I think that um, the, the, the line they use for the square kilometer array is something like uh, a petabyte a night. You know, that's that's how much data uh, it will produce. So for ASCAP, what happens is you've got this radio telescope in the desert and then all of that data has to be sent back to a supercomputing center. So it's, it's correlated and then it's sent back to the supercomputing center. Uh, the images are formed. It takes about as long to form an image as the observation of that image. So um, if the image is a 10 hour observation, it then takes 10 hours to process that and form the image. And that's all done constantly in a supercomputer. So when ASCAP is doing full operations, the supercomputer will have to be running all the time, making images nice. constantly to keep up with the telescope. And some people refer to this as the kind of, the computer is the telescope now. So yes, we're not going to the telescope, looking at it with our eyes. We're essentially sitting here in Sydney um, and Andy is you know, logging into the supercomputer and getting those images that come from the processing. And the same with Meerkat, he also logged into, we had to send our schedule to Meerkat and they, they did the observation. And then Andy had to log into the supercomputer, process the images, download them, and then we do the analysis. All right, we have a few more minutes. So you don't listen on the radio like, um, like we have seen in the movie Contact, right? You don't do No, that. that's right. No, okay. Sorry. Can, can you do a solidification of this signal? Can we can we do, do a what? solidification? Convert this in audio so we can hear it. Yes, look, you could do that. Um, but one of the important things to keep in mind uh, when um, you know Jody Foster's listening for the signals is that the type of signal you expect from an artificial signal. So uh, the type of signals that SETI 
uh, researchers are looking for, they tend to be very narrow band signals. That's our assumption, okay? And I'm, I obviously, I'm not a safety researcher. I'm not an expert on this, but typically um, they're looking for narrow band signals and you can convert them to an audio signal much more easily in the same way that um, a radio, you know, if you've got an analog radio, then the job of that device uh, is actually to convert electromagnetic radiation to sound. That's what the physical device called a radio does. Um, in our observations, they're very broadband observations. So they go across a really wide frequency range. ASCAP itself has a, a bandwidth of about 300 megahertz. Mm. But these objects that we see, they're detected over um, a, a bandwidth of gigahertz. And so converting them to sound wouldn't quite uh, produce the same effect that you you might be thinking of with a radio. Okay, so one last question. Thank you for the audience. Uh, the question I asked come from the from the viewers, by the way. So of course, of thank course. you very yes. much for uh, for providing those questions and for you for both of you for taking the time to answer to them. So I have a final question for you and for each of you. We like each of you to answer to this question. So what is next for you or for the project? Andy, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. Yeah, so so the first step is uh, obviously we want to uh, observe the source again and try to figure out what is the origin of the source. Uh, we plan to observe the source use different telescopes to try to catch the source again. Uh, but apparently so far we haven't detect any. But hopefully we, in the future we can detect the source and. Uh, pin down the like the interpretation of the signal and finally to know what exactly the signal is. And thank you. What about you? Uh, for me, the next step is thinking about broader than just this object. Uh, we're starting our full vast survey next year. And so right now, actually, we're finalizing the details of the proposal for the time allocation for the full survey. So we will be starting this survey uh, look with hopefully thousands of hours of ASCAP time. We'll be looking for everything from gamma ray bursts through to flaring stars, uh, through to weird scintillation effects as the uh, radio waves travel through the interstellar medium. So we're hoping to have a whole range of new scientific discoveries coming in, in the next year or two. It's definitely an exciting time for uh, radio astronomy, I would say, with this. Uh, Very much, yes. Yeah. For any students watching us at the moment, if you, um, yeah, and radio astronomy is definitely one of the cool, cool, cool field of research to go to for the next 10 years, definitely, because of this new facility and these new discoveries. Uh, we talk a lot about radio astronomy at the SETI Institute. We talk a lot about... Uh, the search for techno signatures. Uh, today, that was not about techno signature. That was about what I will, what you call a galactic center or radio transient, which is a kind of, a, of an interesting way of calling something we don't really understand, as you mentioned. But it's equally interesting. That's the way we solve the mystery of the universe. We find one source first. We find sources which are slightly similar, and then later on, we build a theory about or an hypothesis around this, uh, the origin of this source. The same happened for gamma rebirths in the past, uh, for uh, FRBs, etc. So radio astronomy is really kind of booming, I will say, because of the sensitivity and the, the large uh, survey you can do now. So thank you very much to both of you, Tara and uh, Andy. Thank you. For uh, stopping by virtually and talk to us about, uh, about your work and this uh, fun discovery, which I'm sure we're going to hear about in the future. The Andes source source. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I hope to see you in person. I'm planning to go to Australia as soon as possible. So I'm going to wait a bit, but enough is going to come. And I'm, we'll be in the new continent very soon. So thanks uh, uh, also to all our viewers for watching us. Uh, this was City Life from the City Institute. I remind you the City Institute is a non-profit organization. Uh, we rely on you donation to do this research to do this, even this program, this outreach program, to bring to you the wonder of the universe in life. This paper was published uh, very recently, so we really wanted you to, uh, to hear about this from the uh, main authors of the paper. So if you are inclined, 
Uh, you can make a small donation to the SETI Institute. Go to seti.org slash donate. Uh, you can also uh, simply follow us on social, on social media. We're on every platform. Um, like this video, share this video, talk about us. And uh, yeah, the more the better, as, you, as usual. Uh, we hope to hear more about, uh, about you soon. And one more thing, we have a very special SETI talk uh, in November. Uh, the 17th at 7 p.m. Pacific time, we are going to talk about UAPs, uh, this uh, weird phenomena we see in the sky, and we're going to talk about them in a scientific view. Uh, basically, we are going to ask ourselves as scientists, do they deserve to be studied? And if yes, why? Or if no, why not? Okay, but that's all. So if you want to see this SETI talk, I recommend you check out right away our SETI, page, SETI Institute page because we will have a limited amount, um, amount of, um, of viewers to participate to this uh, Zoom webinar. But for again, Tara, Andy, thank you very much. I hope to see you soon in person or for another uh, source or another major discovery in radio astronomy. Bye-bye.